in this recording, I will be discussing the actual process of translation. And it is better if you have already watched my introductory coverage on the requirements for translation, which of course would require the ribosome, the mRNA, and the tRNA molecules. Just to clarify things, notice that I am going to show my mRNA as a yellow strand right here. And then my ribosome is, of course, the one that is uh, shaped like uh, this because it has always been drawn like that. And then the tRNAs are colored blue with their corresponding uh, amino acids. Okay. Now, I think I would uh, prefer starting at this point. And first, let me discuss what happens at the very start, which we could consider as the initiation phase of translation. So here we need, first and foremost, our mRNA, of course. Do note that uh, uh, this RNA would uh, have a cap and have a poly A tail if it were eukaryotic. If it was prokaryotic, it would just be like this. And uh, all of the yellow parts here are expected to be coding or uh, are, are what you call exons. But for the first time, I'm going to show you that at the five prime end, so like the the first few bases or uh, first few sequences of the mRNA strand, we always have something called an RBS, which would stand as the ribosome. Where can I write? Maybe here. Ribosome binding site. I believe uh, some references call it also as, um, uh, how, do, how do you call that? I actually forgot what, what it could be also called, but yeah, the more common name for this is the ribosome binding site. And this is a consensus sequence. So remember how I used the word consensus before, just like to promote the region so that depending on whether it's a prokaryote or eukaryote, it's kind of universal. For most prokaryotes, they have very uh, conserved or, or, or similar sequences. For eukaryotes, they have their own. Uh, uh, conservation. For prokaryotes, the most common uh, name for the RBS, which is conserved for most prokaryotes, is the Schindel-Garnot sequence. And then for the eukaryotes, we instead call the consensus RBS as the COSA sequence. And as the name implies, this RBS is critical for the smaller SS, standing for smaller subunit of the ribosome to um, Hatch or to, to, to read this properly, okay? So in a way, you can think of this as like the verification site, like uh, the ribosome confirms that it's gonna start translation by uh, scanning the schindel garnot or the Kozak sequence. Um, do note that in the entire process of translation, there are many quote unquote factors that we will be talking about. So for example, I, actually I will not be talking in this, about in this recording, but I'm just gonna mention that we have things called IFs or initiation factors, or even EFs or elongation factors. However, I do believe that this is beyond the level of complexity I want to discuss in this recording. So I'm going to uh, disregard them altogether. Of course, if you uh, are discussing a, a translation topic that requires you to uh, study the different IFs or EFs, you have to do it on your own. But at least I'm giving you the idea of how translation is done um, here. So by the guide of certain IFs, we go from here all the way down to here. Wherein, of course, the first thing is that the smaller subunit binds to the mRNA. So it now looks like this. And uh, in this case, we could call the entire thing as a 30S initiation complex. Of course, if this was a prokaryote, so if this was a eukaryote, this would uh, instead be 40S, okay? Now, of course, uh, we have to include the larger subunit, which is for prokaryotes 50S, for eukaryotes 60S. So that's why we put this here after that. And of course, this would be by the help of a separate initiation factor. But anyway, the point is, once we place the larger subunit over the 30S initiation complex, of course, the entire thing here now is gonna have a different name. Uh, if this was a prokaryote, all of this will now be called the 70S initiation complex. If this is a eukaryote, it's an 80S initiation complex. Do note that the RBS is kind of 
towards the uh, left side, which faces the, the E site. And the start codon AUG is actually facing the P site or the peptidyl site. That is the, the order or the placement that we will always observe for every initiation phase of translation. Of course, since AUG is the start codon, this will recruit the very, very, very first amino acid. Of course, based on my previous recording, methionine, to be brought by the very, very first tRNA, which will, of course, enter the P site. Oh, by the way, once we have this going on here, that marks the transition from the initiation phase to our elongation phase, which is the entire thing you're seeing right here. So again, just to recap you on what happened. So here, we start at this uh, figure. We have, again, our smaller subunit with its mRNA. This is the RBS. The RBS has already done its part during the initiation. And then we have the start codon facing its corresponding anticodon for the tRNA, bringing in the very, very first amino acid at the P site. So, of course, uh, this will not be a peptide if this was only an amino acid. So we have to add more amino acids. So in the A site, so you should remember that, well, actually it's written here. So at the A site, we of course have our next, um, we have our next three bases. So this is the next codon, so to speak. And uh, we have to recruit the proper tRNA for that codon. So let's just say that this is the proper tRNA corresponding to this next codon. So of course, this tRNA will be bringing in amino acid number two. We think of methionine as amino acid one in that case. But uh, a side note, you must take note. You must remember that tRNA has the job of bringing amino acids. So that must mean that there's also a time wherein our tRNA does not have, as you can see here, it does not possess on its top any amino acid. In this case, you call this version of our tRNA as the uncharged form or the uh, 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 inactive. Uh, sorry, I think it's supposed to be inactive. Inactivated form of tRNA. Of course, it should uh, hold an amino acid. So just imagine that our tRNA is uh, going to bind with its corresponding amino acid. And they will be brought together by the enzyme called amino acyl tRNA synthetase. After that, it will now hold its amino acid at its amino acid attachment site, which is here at the top. And we now describe this tRNA as the charged form or the active form. That's why sometimes the conversion of the inactive to the active form of tRNA is just called the activation phase. Needless to say, it's obvious that since tRNA only makes sense or is only useful if it brings amino acids with it, um, we expect that only the active form is useful for translation. So now, of course, we now assume that the tRNA bringing it with it, carrying it um, with it, the proper amino acid goes to the A site. And after that, we now have two tRNA molecules. The first tRNA holding the first amino acid at the P site, and then the second tRNA holding the second amino acid at its at the ribosome's A site. Now, at this point, you will notice that the two amino acids are holding on to their respective tRNAs. But we know that in order for a peptide to be made, the amino acids should be attached to each other, which of course you see here, the two amino acids are not yet attached. So we're gonna have to do something about that. The next step is called transpeptidation, wherein from the name itself, there's the formation of a peptide bond. So I'm just gonna use the color code orange here. So uh, in transpeptidation, what we will do is to finally connect the two amino acids here, but at the expense of what? You will notice that on the first tRNA, which is the one at the P site, our methionine has severed or broken its bond here in order to finally connect with the amino acid beside it at the A site. Thus, it's kind of like an equivalent exchange 
methionine loses its connection with its tRNA in order to bond with the amino acid beside it. In that case, that leaves our middle tRNA uncharged. And in that case, you can imagine uh, uh, as if the tRNA at the middle has done its job. Remember, the way we call it tRNA or transfer RNA, their job is to transfer or deliver amino acids to the ribosome. They've done it. And probably, you know, if this had feelings, it would be happy because it's like, hey, I'm done with my job. I brought my amino acid. And this amino acid is now part of a larger thing, a peptide. So it's uh, very much happy to go. So notice, the next step in the elongation process is translocation. Imagine uh, the mRNA strand as rigid, it's not moving. And then think as if, you know, if you have your like fingers or your two, two of your fingers, you have them on, on your screen, placing it on the two subunits of the ribosome and then drag it to the right. Imagine that you're dragging the ribosome to the right. In that case, if you are trying to drag this thing to the right, in perspective, it's like also moving this M mRNA to the left, right? And if you, hopefully you could imagine that, right? I, I try to drag my ribosome to the right. In that case, like from, from this position, the entire ribosome would be going to this side. And the AUG will be moving to the left. So something like what you are seeing here. Let me just erase the mess here. Yeah. So now the AUG has moved to pretty much the E side here. Okay. And then the two amino acids have also moved to the left. So the one in the middle a while ago moved here and the one at the right moved to the middle. Now, look at this. This is our uncharged tRNA moving to the E side. And remember, what does E stand for? Exit, right? And therefore, we will now fulfill that exit word because, the un well, anyway, I did mention that the uncharged tRNA is already done with its job. It's already, it's already delivered its amino acid. It's now uncharged. So it doesn't have anything to do anymore in the ribosome. It exits the ribosome, as the word exit implies. And now we are stuck with our tRNA in the middle, holding, in this case, what seems to be a dipeptide, two amino acids. Now, that is the reason why we call this as the P site in the first place. Because as my, you know, three amino acids after another step will become three, after another step will become four, and then five, and then so on until it stops at some point. It's always the case that the peptide is going to be held at the P site. Peptidyl. And then, of course, since the A site has been vacated, we are now ready to read the next codon. And assuming that the codon here is part of the 61 coding ones, we will have to recruit another amino acid. And then, in that case, we could assume the third one will go in and then the entire process will repeat. Of course, once we add the third codon, we now have a tripeptide at the middle. The A site is now vacated again. And then we have the, the next three codes, uh, next three bases, that would be the fourth codon, and then repeat. And this goes on and on and on. As it's stated here, it repeats as long as the next codon is not a stop codon. So it's a continuous process of recruiting the next tRNA, doing transpeptidation, translocating it, then recruiting, and then forming the next peptide bond, and then moving the ribosome again, and so on and so forth. Of course, the condition is not a stop codon. So we know that this thing will end or terminate once, finally, as you, for example, you can imagine here, the next codon is one of the three stop codons, be it UGA, UAA, or um, U, U, huh? UAG, okay? What happens if we have a stop codon? If we have a stop codon, of course, remember, we, we call it a stop codon, Okay, because it's not coding, it doesn't equate to any amino acid. So you don't expect it to recruit a tRNA. What, remember, tRNAs bring amino acids, assuming that I have a codon. But if the codon does not correspond to an amino acid, why should we bring a tRNA? That makes sense, right? So instead of a tRNA, what will UAA attract? It will attract a so-called RF or a release factor which by a mechanism that cannot fit my slide anymore, 
just imagine that RF is some kind of scissors. It goes to the A site. And then again, we have a peptide. Our protein right now is at the P site. You can just imagine that this bond is like cut by the RF, okay, by a certain you know, uh, mechanism. And then the entire complex, the 70S or the 80S initiation can complex finally disassembles. And uh, that's why in the first place, we even call it a stop codon. Uh, initially, if you watch my introduction video for translation, it shouldn't make sense, right? Like, uh, why is it that we, we, we just called them, I mean, we just know that WAG, UGA, and WAA are not equivalent for any amino acid. What does that have to do with them being called stop codons? And the answer is right here. The fact that instead of, we know we, we, they will not recruit any amino acid. Instead of recruiting a tRNA, they instead recruited actually something else that will disintegrate, not really disintegrate, but stop the elongation phase, stop. Therefore, that's why we call them a stop codon. And of course, once this is uh, cut, the peptide escapes the ribosome, the entire complex um, um, uh, uh, disassembles, the entire process stops. So we assume that this protein that will be floating away from the ribosome is the final product for translation. However, in my next recording, I will be explaining that most of the proteins we have after the release factors have done their job will still be modified and will still have a lot of things to go through.